Want to discover your new favorite band? Visit pace.com slash music today. This is the world of rock, and John Anderson will be joining us here in the studio in just a moment. We'll be talking with John about his new solo album, as well as all the great music that he's made over the years, and uh, the contributions of Yes, and uh, his involvement in so many other projects, too. John Anderson is a man who is always busy, and I guess that's, uh, that's proof of genius. John, you've got a solo album and just recently completed the Yes Project. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> Van Gelis again, maybe. I think we're, actually, I was on the phone to Van Gelis yesterday, and he's in Greece. He, he's just finished uh, his new album, and we decided to get together this summer and uh, make an album. Well, I just wanted to show everyone how busy you stay yeah, because it's I like to work hard you know I don't I think when I was a kid I used to work on a farm very close to where I lived and uh, that set me going on the idea that uh, if you're enjoying your work you don't realize it's work and uh, I enjoy making music and writing and thinking about my future and what I'd like to be doing so I've got to build up on that all the time so the only way to the only way to develop in life is really to work on it I suppose you were talking about when you were younger, yeah, and uh, you stayed busy. When when was the first music influence? How did that happen? I mean, you said oh, you were yeah. on the farm, but somewhere something happened, right, that got you interested in music. I think it was uh, there was a, a radio station in Europe called Radio Luxembourg. It's still going, and we used to listen to it uh, on our uh, old old radio. And I remember hearing "Bye Bye Love." The Everly Brothers, uh, and <laughs> great, uh, record. great record, and uh, early Buddy Holly, and uh, Eddie Cochran, all these kind of things on the radio, and uh, because I was on the farm, you know, you're kind of uh, out there in the fields and uh, doing a lot of haymaking, which is just cutting the grass down and letting it dry, ready for food for the cows and stuff, and you'd sing along all the time, you'd always be singing with my brother, so we'd be the Everly Brothers of... Uh, north of England, the Accrington in fact. And so that sort of instilled that uh, enjoyment of just singing naturally, you know, and uh, mimicking, basically mimicking uh, the radio. And I, I remember um, my first real inclination as to the idea of becoming a singer was uh, I went on a trip down to Liverpool uh, on a sort of a long distance uh, lorry driving. Uh, we were taking uh, some uh, stuff to Liverpool and I went to uh, this little alleyway and I saw all these sort of trendy people walking down they were trendy in them days they were sort of beatniks and they were all walking down from this place and I asked uh, what's the place and they said this is the cavern and I'd heard about the cavern this is like very early 1963 and uh, I went in the cavern and the atmosphere was unbelievable and there was a band playing there called the Big Three one of the very early Mersey beat bands, you know, and it's it was only a year later that I was actually playing in the cavern So you can imagine that sort of instant appeal to the idea of singing and the idea of being in a group, you know, it was all Pre-planned in a way you mean you went back home and just hey. started to work and and you were back there a year later Yeah, I went back to Accrington. Some mates from yeah, my brother was in a group and they had two singers and one of them left and so I just joined, and we were the sort of we we do Everly Brothers and some very early rock and roll Elvis Presley songs and things like that. The uh, the Bryant family wrote a lot of those great hits for uh, the Everly Brothers, Don and Phil, who I guess like a lot of other people who got really close because of uh, being in the entertainment business didn't get along that well, even though they were brothers. Yeah. So they had a number of splits, but. Uh, Bye Bye Love, as you mentioned, is just a great record, and there's no better time to let everybody hear it again than right now. Wherever you are joining us on the world of rock in our studios is John Anderson of Yes. Okay, there you were, and then you were in the hall just a couple of years, I mean, right around the time the Beatles had come out of there and all. Yeah. And there you are, and it was really like a basement, wasn't it? Kind of yeah. a cavern, just it exactly was. what it... It was, exactly. It was... Uh... But the atmosphere was there, you know, and you knew the Beatles had played there, the Hollies and Jerry and the Pacemakers and all these Mersey Beats and all these people that had played there had left a certain image there, you know, and you went there and uh, there, was, 
the next step, actually, it's very interesting that we did play there and we traveled around England, went to Germany, and then I left that original group that was called the Warriors. I was just going to ask you. Yeah. And uh, we went back to, I went back to London. And the first place that I went to when I was in London was the Marquee Club. I got off the train, I met a friend of mine who was with the original Warriors, and uh, we went straight to the Marquee Club and I saw the nice. And that's, in a way, that was a sort of a, hey, step number two, <laughs> you know, get on with it, you know, get a Keith band Emerson, together. Right. Keith Emerson was playing, it was, it was unbelievable. And Jimi Hendrix played the following week. And The Who played a week later, so I got to know all these people. And uh, I, in fact, I was helping out at the marquee when I wasn't with Yes, and I was just looking for a group of people to start a band. You know, and uh, that's how I bumped into Chris and uh, started Yes. It was all in the same vicinity. In fact, the club that I met Chris Squire was uh, upstairs from the Marquee Club. When we first started, me and Chris, uh, we decided that we wanted to emulate uh, the Nice, which was a very major musical band. That was the sound of the Nice, a group that Keith Emerson had put together, and of course we all know later that was Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. But as Nice, it was part of the roots of the beginning of Yes. And uh, as John Anderson has said, influences are everything. As a matter of fact, toward the beginning of Yes, John Anderson... In America, the one band that really made us think, and uh, we actually saw them, uh, at the Madison Square Garden Atlantic concert was uh, Vanilla Fudge. Major, major musical uh, development for many people in Europe, many artists in, the, in England especially. The idea of changing music around instead of just doing the format of three minute songs or three and a half minute songs, they could actually stretch that musical imagination. And uh, we knew that we needed good musicians to be able to pull that off and we were lucky. The first steps were with Bill Bruford and uh, Tony Kay and uh, Peter Banks. And they, were, they were already unwilling to try out new adventurous music. And during the course of the, the albums that we made, we always seemed to need to take the chance with other people. We'd, we'd try and make changes when we knew inside, me and Chris had decided that uh, we needed a, a more adventurous keyboard player, and that's when Rick Wakeman came into the group. And then eventually we needed a, a, a more wider scope guitar player and that's when Steve Howe joined the band so <clears throat> over the years we kept really realizing our um, musical potential by adding better musicians uh, along the way that was the idea and you know the other thing that stands out and I speak for the viewer the listener and the yes fan is no matter where you went or when you performed the event of a concert was a show. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just the music of Yes, which no. everybody held closely, but you always, uh, expenditure, I don't even want to think about it because that's not really my department, but there was always that, there was just magic. I think there was definitely re reinvestment. We always reinvested a lot of monies in staging. The idea of entertainment came from way, way back. Uh, I remember uh, mid 60s I went to see a group who were pretty famous in England uh, their the name uh, eludes me at the moment but the, f the fact was they were very famous uh, they were in the top 10 and they were putting on a show near where I lived at that time and uh, there was only about 40 people turned up and this was like a 3,000 sort of uh, seater auditorium in the north of England and they were called the Baron Knights very famous band in England. And there was only about 40, 50 people there. And we were the opening group, the Warriors. And uh, we sat there and they put on the whole show all the way through. And that stayed with me. The fact that no matter who's there, no matter what, if you're professional, you always put on your show. And that's why Yes always wants to put on a, an entertaining evening, an event, if you like. And uh, that stuck with us. I think that's uh, part and parcel of the yes uh, idea of making music. No matter, we'll try and make uh, diverse sort of musical avenues, but eventually we'll always come back to try and entertain the audience, either visually or musically at the same time. That's part and parcel of it. 
Scott Muni talking with John Anderson on the world of rock. The up-to-date picture of John Anderson is, um, is again, multifaceted because now you have a solo album as well as the Big Generator Yes album with the, the uh, current makeup in the tour and the visitation for the Atlantic 40th anniversary party mm -hmm. you guys got together. Yeah. How was that? Was that, that, a was, that was real fun. A big family affair backstage. Uh, just meeting up with uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash and the Coasters and uh, Benny King, uh, Phil Collins. Oh, uh, the, to, to me, the, the, the penultimate time was when Led Zeppelin played and Jason Bonham played, the son of the original drummer, when he played with the band and he kicked that band around. He really made them work. And it was, here's a, a young, I don't know how old he's probably 18 or 19 years old. It, yeah, it, it gives you a great sense of what real rock and roll music is really all about. That it is a ever, it's an ever growing thing. It's not uh, at all stagnant. You're getting these young kids coming through, and they're going to show the older people how to do it. Uh, as far as as far as I'm concerned, you know, my album uh, in the City of Angels is a a sort of stepping stone to what I want to be doing in the next two or three years. It's something that. Uh, in some ways, the idea to do the album in L.A. and to work with uh, session musicians and Toto and Lamont Dozier, get a, get a producer, it's all very different for me, you know? And to work with Stuart Levine, who had just come off the uh, Simply Red album and the Boy George album, to bring in a guy who was very commercially minded and to extend my sort of... Uh, musical ideas to him and him to mold me into this sort of uh, possibly more accessible album it was all a sort of a challenge in a way so john anderson um is wearing a number of different outfits true in the city of angels album and had fun doing all of them including the motown outfit and the toto outfit mm -hmm. lamont dozier who obviously to you was a legend yeah, here's this I guy used, who yeah. wrote all these great songs and produced a bunch of tremendous records in uh, a different field than you were in, but that was something you loved? He was Motown. Yeah. He was, sincerely, I used to sing uh, I'll Be There and all most of his hits, and uh, to actually meet this guy, and I remember walking into his, his room in L.A., and I've never seen so many cassettes in my life. It was cassettes all over the table, all over the piano, half of them on the floor, in boxes, I mean, this guy wakes up and starts writing. He's just a very pro prolific uh, character. And uh, as soon as he starts to sing, he sounds like everybody you've ever known from Motown. I think he taught everybody how to sing and in terms of phrasing, in terms of emotion. And that uh, to work with him, we just worked for two hours and we wrote four songs, and two of them are on the album. In two hours? Yeah. Well, we. That's what we were for. Yeah. That, you know, we weren't going to go out and play golf. You know, you know, we sit there and we make music because that's what we are. And, and so it, there and was immediate respect with you too. I mean, he incredible. just got into your thing and you yeah. got into his, and the uh, proof is in the album. Yeah. From John Anderson's solo album in the City of Angels, A Touch of Motown with Lamont Dozier and Hold On to Love. Now, of course, I would be, uh, I wouldn't be doing my duty if I didn't ask you. Uh, obviously, your love of Yes and all of its members and its history and its tradition, now about 20 years old, would be, uh, what about John Anderson doing something that John Anderson wants to do? Not just the album, because that's obvious and that's great. Mm -hmm. But what about, would there be maybe a tour of some type that you would like to do? I would try, I think I would try to do a small theater tour like a one-man show, I think that would be interesting to try in order that I could start to maybe handle theatre, the idea of theatre, because I've written a couple of uh, musicals. I think most uh, people who have been in rock and roll after a certain time start to stretch their imagination and tend to come up with uh, musicals and, and want to break through into different levels of uh, the show business scene, right? So uh, I've already done uh, music for dance in Scotland and in France, so sort of ballet. I've always enjoyed that side of music, uh, the classical side, if you like. 
But the idea to do, to do a one-man show started to make me think that uh, it would put me more on the spot. I could entertain the audience with music from Yes, from Vangelis, also these ideas that I have from my albums and also some of the other music that I'm very interested in. And uh, I'm actually going to pull that together this summer and maybe try it for a month later this autumn. We'll have to wait and see. Another idea that I had, uh, but this depends on Vangelis. See, Vangelis has never toured. He just hasn't done it. He'll do a show once a year or twice a year, and it's spectacular. I mean, to actually be in the audience and listen to Vangelis perform is, uh, is very special. I'd love to be able to take him on tour. So I'd open up the show, then he'd play, and then we'd both get together and do a special at the end, you know. And you do want to uh, tour yourself. You have a few goals. You'd like to go to the Far East, wouldn't you? Very much. I mean, the whole idea of doing a one-man show is so I can put the stage in a suitcase. You know, you, these days you've got to travel with three trucks. Yes, does not put their stage in I a know. suitcase. No, that no. stage is... 80 vans. Oh, it's just wild. So I had this idea if I could get a stage where I put it on the floor and drop a bit of water on it and all of a sudden, it, you know, it blows up into a stage. I'd love to be able to travel uh, through China. I've always had a dream to, uh, there's a lot of people out there and it's not a, it's totally not a financial thing. It's definitely an emotional thing. Uh, and then again, a possibly a spiritual thing that the first things that the Chinese people learn about the Western people is art, music, and the love of life. And I think that's very important that they realize this is where we've got, we know we've got to get to that point very quickly. And I think it's wise for artists to want to go there just to make music and uh, entertain people. This is Scott Muni on the World of Rock, and we're talking with John Anderson. Well, hopefully, uh Having uh, influences and uh, your uh, 20 years at this point of of uh, wonderful contributions to our music that uh, now across America, your future, the future of the group, and other people too. And you mentioned young people, and uh, that's one of the constant challenges that we have mm -hmm. on a program like this is new music because uh, people have to have that door opened and... Uh, are talking about, uh, well, what about, uh, you must have something in mind, for instance, of something that you heard that you liked and it didn't happen. You know, that's something we're curious. Yeah. Why certain things sounded real good <clears throat> to you and you liked the group or something? Do you have any? Well, the, the, one, the one that comes to mind is a, a group called PhD, which I think was a Scottish band. And they had a, a big record in England. I, I actually loved the song so much. I think it was called uh, I Won't Let You Down. Won't let you down again. That was the chorus. It was sort of very Paul Simon type song. Well, wouldn't that be interesting? Now you're just talking about that, and it. Why shouldn't everyone have the right to hear it right now? True. The uh, future of Yes is in the hands of uh, of you, great people, and John. Everybody loves Yes, and you know what? The incredible thing is, no matter what has happened, in case, like you mentioned, Rick before, and Rick was in, and then out of the group, and so forth. But it doesn't make any difference. It is one major event when Yes comes to town. So uh, now I know that the Atlantic 40th anniversary was a chance for you guys to get together again now. Is there sort of a map, a future plan now of Yes with the big generator album out and doing fantastic? You know? Yeah, we're going to give uh, the summer and autumn a break. And then I think later this year we're going to put together a new idea. I don't think we're just going to make another album. I think we've got certain plans as to try and expand the relevance of what a group like Yes can achieve. You know, we, we had a very, very strong time in and around Fragile, close to the A's, topographic oceans in the mid 70s. And we've sort of happily gone through the 80s and we're heading towards the 90s very fast, you know. And so we want to put together an album that defines the music of where we want to go in the 90s. It might be a double album set, it might be a series of 12-inch uh, singles. We're not quite sure. We want to do something that little bit more than the normal. And I think that uh, the band's quite capable of it. And one more thing that we m possibly might do uh, next year is try and do a special event where everybody who ever played with the band will get together and we'll do a five-day 
uh, concert, maybe in Philadelphia, maybe in New York, not, not in Madison Square Gardens, but a theatrical experience of what Yes has been doing over the years and just try and bring in Rick and Steve and, and have an event for a week and film it for, you know, for a, a video or something like that. I think that would be what really Yes has been always about. You know, it's a, an ever-growing situation and we shouldn't forget our past as well as uh, where we should be going in the future. My thanks to you, John Anderson, for a wonderful hour of great music, memories, thoughts. Thank you so very much.